Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia Success Podcast, where we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. On this show, I work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. This week, I'm talking to my friend, Dr. Jesse Lopez. I really enjoyed this week's discussion because he shares when you plan the latter years of your career as a physician, it helps you work towards it in such a way that you can be in many ways insulated from a lot of the stresses and strains that come with the career of being a physician. We also talked about how as a physician, it's important to make your finances work for you to contribute to this end and help protect you from burnout. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 34 of the Anesthesia Success Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Harvey. I'm really excited to be joined today by my friend, Dr. Jesse Lopez. Jesse is an attending anesthesiologist in Columbus, Ohio. He's also an entrepreneur. He's a podcaster. He uh, is the uh, proprietor at docofalltrades.com, as well as he runs the Physician Negotiator Podcast. So, Jesse, thanks a lot for joining us today. Oh, great to be here. Thank you, Justin. Um, so we met most recently at the, uh, the FinCon conference. There's been a few guests of this show who have met at FinCon. So it's obviously the financial nerd Mecca. And, uh, there's a few people in medicine, uh, you know, that, that I've met there. It's been an interesting experience. Oh, I, I love FinCon. I love the community. And what really surprised me this year was how much this community is growing. And, uh, I think when I first started, there were a few thousand. Now it's, uh, what, over 6,000 people in attendance? It's incredible. Yeah, and and I think a lot of the pressures in medicine make make uh, physicians in this FinCon community, uh, it, it's, a, it's a natural fit because you can really help to insulate yourself from a lot of the issues and problems um, in healthcare by pursuing financial independence, having a plan, and moving towards a desired end intentionally rather than letting life kind of happen to you, would you say? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, financial literacy was something that I was really attracted to. And I really got to credit um, Leaf Daly from uh, Physician on Fire for really getting me involved in that. Um, and if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have ever known what FinCon was. And the beautiful thing about it, it during the, the genesis of discovering myself as a, um, as a blogger and as a podcaster, I was able to then grow a community of other like-minded physicians who had the, who had similar stories and similar goals in mind. So, you know, I can't thank these people enough. Um, I'd love to hear from you, Jesse. I mean, you've, you've been practicing anesthesia since the early 2000s, and you have a good sense for the arc of what anesthesiology has looked like. Um, talk a little bit about that journey for you and, and how things were for you clinically and from a career standpoint when you first started and how things have evolved over time. Physician is a completely different animal from when I started. I kind of feel like an old man now. I still remember my first day as an attending, and that was back in 2005. And uh, I remember being the youngest you know, person there. And uh, I had a lot of older attendings that were telling me how it was. Um, and I specifically remember early on in my career that it was um, sink or swim. They would throw you into the fire as an anesthesiologist. And if you, did, if you could not survive the clinical pace if you can survive uh, the onslaught of emotional attacks from older peers because they're they're challenging you and they're and they're trying to push you, um, then you wouldn't make it. Uh, it was it was very 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 difficult. And you know uh, I've been recently watching The Office again uh, with, yes. a, <laughs> with a new set of lenses because the first time I watched The Office I didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was funny. Now I'm watching it and I'm kind of going through trauma because you know. <laughs> Quite frankly, you know, my first five years as an attending, as a junior attending, was uh, it, it made the office look like nothing, hmm. because it was very, it was very, it was a very challenging environment. Um, there was no holds barred. Nobody, uh, nobody cushioned anything that they said. Um, if if an atten if a, a surgical attending who had been there for twenty years didn't like you, they would tell you you're an idiot to your face. Um, and it was it was very very hostile, you know. Um, that being said, I loved anesthesia. I thought anesthesia was amazing. And to me, I thought, well, you know, there's a couple of, you know, rough personalities uh, in medicine. I, I get that. I, you know, I went in medical school and in residency, I experienced the exact same thing. And I realized that if I could just circumvent, not not circumvent, but if I could rise above those personalities and, you know, perform excellently, then I could rise myself to the top 
and become an excellent clinician and then possibly even run the department someday. Yeah. And so can, do you recall any specific stories or instances that would maybe help to embody and give some color to, to those ideas early on? Oh my goodness. I remember the, uh, as, as, as an example, onboarding this day and age is very gentle. So if, if I were to onboard a new CRNA or an anesthesiologist, typically we'd give them two or three weeks of, uh, being one-on-one with another anesthesiologist or another CRNA, we would ease them into this call schedule. They probably wouldn't take call for the first month and we would give them cases to try them. Like, you know, here's a, here is a case that with a low hanging fruit, it's easy, maybe a lap coli, something that to get them familiar with the equipment, with the personalities, with the process. My first week, I am pretty sure I did two ruptured triple A's. So, and um, it was like sink or swim and working at a level one trauma center uh, back in the day, we didn't have a lot of uh, support in the evening. So I, I recall my very first night on call, um, I'm by myself. Uh, I've just been practicing medicine for maybe a month or two and a giant level one trauma comes in for, for the audience who doesn't know what that is. That's, you know, uh, you know, um, a very serious case where someone's it's life or limb. So, and I remember I'm by myself and my job was to set up the room, call the backup guy and cover another clinical area at the same time. Wow. You know, and again, there was absolutely 100% no backup. I was 100% by myself. And if anything else happened in the hospital, that was also my responsibility. Wow. So it was a bit overwhelming. Um, but, you know, I feel a little bit honored because I, I survived. I was able to handle that clinical pressure. And other members, uh, you know, other friends of mine, they, you know, they were good, but they just didn't like it. They couldn't handle the, the emotional pressure of it. So they ended up leaving. So they didn't, they didn't survive that practice. Hmm. Uh, whereas today, um, had I started today, it would be a much, much, much different experience. Hmm. And so what kinds of things are you seeing today? Like how would that have transpired, you know, in 2020? In 2020, it's, it's a, you know, if there's a very, very, very challenging case like that, and um, you, you want to put the right person with the right set of skills to guarantee a person a chance to succeed, right? So I'm not going to put a brand new attending into a ruptured AAA and give them the chance to fail. I'm not going to set them up for failure. Um, and so this, this, in this environment, you, you know, I, you know I'm, put it this way, recently, What's been happening at larger organizations, including my current organization, is that competency is expected. Everybody expects you to be comp- comp- um, competent. If you are a board certified anesthesiologist or board certified surgeon, you know they expect you to be excellent at what you do. The new paradigm is you actually have to behave at the same time. So you you can't act like you're in a bar, you know. You can't say, you know, uh, uh, very inappropriate comments to anybody or you risk being fired. And I, I know a couple of people that have been fired recently for, you know, kind of pushing beyond, you know, the, the line. You know, it's, it's funny. Michael from the office calls it going over the line. These guys go, they went over the line and they, they thought they were untouchable. And now they're no longer employed with, uh, with, with our organization. And this has happened in multiple organizations uh, in, in with all the other anesthesia groups that I know of. Yeah. So talk a little bit about um, your your businesses through both docofalltrades.com and Physician Negotiator Podcast. And by the way, we're going to link to these in the show notes. So uh, anesthesiasuccess.com slash 34 will have links to all of uh, Jesse's endeavors here that are designed to help physicians really thrive uh, clinically, professionally. Talk a little bit about how you kind of got on this mission to want to contribute in that way. So when I first started my website, I was kind of frustrated. Um, most anesthesiologists, and I'm sure most uh, physician attendings, whether they're in academics or in private practice, they want to do their best. They want to excel. They want to succeed. They want to perform clinically excellently. And in my case, I also wanted to succeed as a leader. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to prove myself not only in the OR, but outside the OR. And I wanted to make an impact in my department and in my community. And so what I did is uh, early in my career, I did what everybody else does and what everybody recommends. And I still recommend is I participated in committees. Uh, I volunteered for, you know, anything that came up that somebody needed somebody to volunteer to, you know, to help out with the department, to help out with the hospital. I was that person. Um, 
So countless number of meetings. And as I attended these meetings, I would recognize people would say, hey, thanks for coming to the meeting. You know, I know you're doing it on your own time, et cetera. And slowly that went from me being a person who volunteered to a person who I uh, was actually nominated to be a vice chairman in my department. So I started, you know, having influence. I started getting to know other people in my department. Um, and then outside of the department, I started interacting with the other members of the medical staff community. And I started to learn what the medical staff community was all about. Um, and in that ev evolution over the next 10 years, I ended up going from the chairman, I ended up, I'm sorry, uh, from the vice chairman to the person who ran the schedule. Um, we have something called the Surgery and Governance Council. I, I was a member on that council. And then ultimately, I became the medical director of my department. Now, that would, that's roughly equivalent to being like the president of a group, of a private group, and or like um, kind of like a chairman in an academic department, okay? Obviously, it's, it's not like, when, I'm not part of a medical exec, but I was the administrative arm of the hospital in my, in, my, um, in my department. So I had a lot of responsibilities. And during that process, I, I think I grew too quickly and I didn't have enough mentorship. Hmm. Um, and during that process, as I was running the department, I decided to take on too much. I took on way, way too many tasks. And then ultimately, um, one task I took on in particular was had to do with staffing. And perhaps, you know, because my role was really only to run the Department of Anesthesia, I started to try to run other departments like the Department of Surgery and the Department, you know, and the operating room operations. And then I overstepped my bounds. And in doing that, I, I basically was told that I was my uh, input was not appreciated, and consequently, they thought maybe it was a time for me to try something else. And so, mm. I was no longer the medical director. I was asked. Um, I was I was never stepped. No one ever uh, dismissed me from being the medical director, but I was told that if I wanted to continue being the medical director, I'd have to reapply. And uh, I decided at that point that maybe being a leader wasn't wasn't for me. And so, doc of all trades, kind of helped me work through that process and it continues to help me work through like what does it mean to be an anesthesiologist today what are my what are my values and because what it, what it made it ultimately it did is it made me question my values what was most important to me and suddenly i felt like my values were not in alignment with the hospital's values hmm. and, and again it's not to say their values are bad it's just that they were different and having said that I needed to kind of realign. And so Doc of All Trades is the, and the Physician Negotiator podcast is, was, a, was an attempt to do that. And, and when did all this transpire, Jesse? Oh, man. I think this all went down in 2016, I think. Okay. It's been a while. Okay. Um, and so, but, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, but I was going to say, you know, what, what, what it's taught me, though, was what you think is going to happen in your professional career. When you start out, what you think is going to happen may not necessarily be where you end up. So, um, I, you know, personally, uh, I've been lucky. I've been very, very lucky that things have just kind of worked out for me. I've had, um, since I've uh, met this larger physician community, physician blogger community, I feel like uh, I've received a lot of excellent advice, a lot of mentorship from them. And I've since then grown significantly. Um, and the, the, probably the biggest message that I uh learned, and again, this was just luck, was that, you know, being an anesthesiologist, we're very well compensated. And uh, one of my mentors early on told me to start saving a, uh, more than 20% of my gross income back in the day. And just by happenstance, I just did it without really thinking about it. Hmm. And it turned out really well for me as, as a consequence. Yeah, that was uh, back before it was cool, quote unquote. <laughs> Oh, exactly. And in this in this weird little corner of the world, that's one of the things that happens when you start running around in the financial independence community is you forget that there's like a 99.7% of the rest of the world out there that isn't already automatically saving 25, 30 plus percent yeah, of their income. Exactly. Well, so for anybody my, who's listening in, like just, you know, he, um, Jesse's talking about this community. So there's Physician on Fire, who's been a, a prior guest on this show in episode nine, uh, the physician philosopher, and then the the grandfather of them all, uh, Dr. Jim Dolly at White Coat Investor. Um, these these blogs and these physicians have been really influential in the physician finance community to help doctors like take control of their their money, and then by virtue of their controlling their money, hopefully their their ultimate future and trajectory as a as a professional. 
exactly. And you know, I gotta give, I gotta add one more to there. Is Corey yeah. Fawcett? Um, yes, that's right. You know, so it's funny. Every time I read one of Corey's books, he's written several. I always say to myself, "Man, that's the book I wanted to write." But Corey, Corey's brilliant though because he decided to do uh, to do this whole idea of uh, practice medicine with the end in mind as a medical student. Mm-hmm. So we're talking like in the '80s. This guy was, I mean. If anyone's the grandfather, it was Corey. Cause, yeah. Because uh, hearing his stories, I will. I just stay. I'm just in complete awe every time I speak to the guy. Yeah, and you know, as we're naming names, I'm starting to get a little self conscious because I know Dr. Bonnie Koo also done excellent work. She's actually going to be a guest next week and, and many others. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're one of my friends who has a physician finance blog, I'm, I'm sorry if I if I'm not naming you here. But the point is, there's a growing awareness in the medical community that um, physician finances is kind of a it's like an escape hatch to all of the environmental factors in medicine and healthcare that are uh, eroding physician autonomy and sometimes like work-life balance and ultimately fulfillment and joy and happiness. If, if you find all of that going away, one of the ways to combat that and to push back against these forces is to take control of your money so that you're no longer beholden to an employer who you may not be thrilled with. You, you know, so on that note, um, what I realized was, and I think uh, um, I was burning the candle on both ends. So bear in mind, going back to what I had said earlier, I was still in a level one trauma center doing open heart surgery with a pretty uh, demanding schedule. And on top of that, I was running, I was the medical director running all the operations. And so, and, you know, I'm trying to take care of my family. I, I, at the time, I had a very young family. I have a, a young son who has autism. And so my wife and I, uh, mostly my wife, I had to give her all the credit. We were trying to run an ABA program in our basement with, you know, counselors and teachers in and out of our house 20 hours a, a week. So the, so much was going on. Um, and what, what happened was, and, and this is what I, this is the main advice I give to all physicians. If at any point you feel overwhelmed, you, you need to basically stop and take a pause. And what I, when, when I say that, I mean, you need to take a sabbatical. Um, sometimes just a, an extra week of vacation. I know a lot of my peers only take one week of vacation at a time. I took three weeks of vacation. I mean, I needed time off to clear my mind. And I would never, uh, the, the, amount of, the amount of clarity it gave me, I will never give it up for the world. All the money that I lost as a consequence of not working was totally worth it. And during that process, I realized time was more valuable than money to me at that point. Specifically because, like I said, I had a child with autism and I felt like that was my, my, my professional career was pulling me away from my, my um, personal life. And um, I, do, I didn't want to sacrifice that. And uh, I'm actually writing an article po- about this right now as we speak. I haven't published it yet. Um, because, you know, if you look at the the generation before Generation X, which is what my generation was, they were all about work. Family kind of came second. And then the, the millennials, family comes first, work comes second. And so right wedged in the middle is Gen X, hmm. where we, we have to we have to basically meet the demands of our prior generation, which is works first, and our new peers who says work is second. And so we, we basically try to prioritize them both and end up failing. And so um, that's that. That was ultimately the real struggle. Um, and the way I combated that is, uh, I listened to. I, I was on call one evening, and it was it was after a very very long a long day. I think I'd been working twenty hours straight, and a level one trauma came in, and I remember taking care of this person, and you know they were they they were fine. And one of my peers gave me a break, and I decided to walk out. It's like two or three in the morning, I'm walking out of the operating room. And I leave a trail of blood with my shoes and I look back and I'm like, I'm like that, if that, if that isn't symbolic, I don't know what is. Yeah. And I sat down on a chair. I was just exhausted. And why I did this is beyond me. I started looking at my phone and I started just kind of, you know, trying to get my mind off of what was going on. And I ran into an article about a physician that retired uh, or was about to retire at age 41 or 42. I can't remember what. And I said to myself, that's a thing. Like this is, this is possible. Um, cause for me at that point, I'd never even considered it. I never thought retirement at an early age was even an option. And that's when I first, uh, found out about physician on fire and the fire community and et cetera, et cetera. And so at that point I kind of got it in my head 
that I wanted to back off of my clinical practice uh, and give myself that time that I'm, that I'm telling you about to kind of figure out what I want out of my life and to spend more time with my family. And so probably it's been about a little over a year and a half now. I did just that. Now I'm a, a part-time uh, anesthesiologist. Wow. Awesome. So I didn't realize that you had officially made the transition. So talk a little bit about how that unfolded for you. So it was a part of the reason why I started the physician negotiator podcast was because as the medical director, I was privy to all the meetings. I knew exactly. Uh, I, I was being mentored by other physicians who would then go uh, negotiate their own uh, the groups contracts. And so I kind of started to understand how the inner workings of of hospital hospitals worked. And my first two contracts, I successfully negotiated. And the way I did that was with the help of, of my peers who you know had done it before me. And I started investigating um, uh, MGMA data. I started learning about, you know, um, physician salary surveys. Yeah. And in that process, you know, I got really savvy about making spreadsheets, you know, learning how to figure out what my market value was, how to look, look, you know, how to investigate. It's kind of like real estate, right? You have to figure out your comps, et cetera. In that process, though, I became pretty good at negotiating. And so when it came to 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 do to transition to part time, no one had ever done it in my practice before. So I proposed it. And the way I did it is I basically went to a bunch of my peers who were older than me and I asked them questions. I'm like, well, what do you think about going part time? What do you think it would look like? And how do you feel about that? And so what I did is I was able to get some buy-in with many of my peers. And then once I got buy-in, I constructed a, um, a business model and then I proposed it to the hospital. And the hospital loved the business model. They thought the business model made sense to them. Um, it created um, an extra cushion of anesthesiologists that could potentially work in times when we were busy. And when times weren't as busy, it saved them money. So it was kind of a win-win situation. Everybody was happy. But the funny thing was trying to get all the pieces in alignment sometimes is difficult. Hmm. And I struggled to get all the players to, to all the cogs to move at the same time. And anytime you work in a large organization, I don't care how, you know, what organization it is, especially healthcare, they move incredibly slow. And so first, you know, I, I thought I would get this deal done within a month. One month turned into three three months turned into six, six months turned into a year. And then at that point, I just became very frustrated. And um, I had attended another, I believe at that point, I had attended another FinCon and other, all these other people were doing these amazing things. And what they did was they said, you know, here's the deal. If you want something bad enough, you will find the resources to make it happen. And you have to take massive action. Hmm. So I, uh, it's funny, I was cleaning out my cabinet today. I found my resignation letter in my, uh, in my, in my cabinet. And, uh, it was very simple. I asked, I, I told everybody in the group and I told the hospital that I did not want to um, threaten them. I didn't want to resort to, you know, anything that would uh, be considered hostile. I said, but at the same time, if my needs aren't met, I'm going to have to go someplace where they are met. Hmm. And they said, well, you have to do what you got to do. And so I did, I, re I resigned. Um, and you know, the funny thing about that was it said, you know, people thought I was bluffing and I, and I really, I wasn't even, I wasn't even in poker. I just really wanted to put what I wanted into, into play. And my, my family, I had the total support of my family. Um, and, and then I did it and it was still, despite that, everybody was shocked when I did it. Were so you it kinda, nervous? Was that something where you were like a little jittery as you were going to allow them to quote unquote, I mean, you weren't bluffing. So you're just, it was a bluffing. Okay, fine. Yeah. Like I I'm done. I'm um, done. As that unfolded, were you, how did you feel? So I had attended another conference and there was this, uh, this guy, his name is Mike Mandel, and he talks about this concept of threshold. And threshold is a point where there's got to be a change. It's got to be now and it's got to be me, right? Yeah. And so I knew the change wasn't going to come from without. It had to come from within. And so then I had to basically muster the, the, you know, the, 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 the courage to do this. And, uh, and that's what I did. Now, having said that, going back to the, talking about having the end in mind, I had been saving tons of money that whole time. Um, I didn't go nuts with an extravagant lifestyle. And so I had enough of a cushion that if it did not work out, I would have been fine. Um, and having said that, as a professional, as a, as a professional anesthesiologist, as a professional physician, 
you know, if you have a good standing in your group, you'll also have a good standing in the community. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, I feel like I have a, a very good reputation in my community. And I knew for a fact that if I couldn't get employment elsewhere, I could easily just do locum tenens. There's jobs everywhere. I live in the mid Midwest and literally there's, there's unlimited options. And so I, I figured I had the option of having enough uh, financial cushion and I had the option that I can get another job elsewhere and I had the support of my family. So I had the trifecta. Yeah. And I think anesthesiology is one of those specialties that lends itself quite nicely to locums work. And we uh, interviewed, uh, Kyle Hadley in episode 17, talking about how do you use locums to accelerate your journey to financial independence, even for physicians who are full-time employed or point exactly. employed, you can use it to supplement around the edges. And that can be really, uh, really a really useful tool in the toolbox. Uh, but you, you said something that I want to circle back on. So begin with the end in mind. I think this is such a valuable concept in probably many uh, spheres of life, but one of them is, you know, career and finances and the intersection of those things. So talk a little bit about uh, this concept and what it means to you. And, and also, you know, there was this article that you wrote on your blog that I want to refer to. We'll drop it in the show notes. So anesthesiasuccess.com slash 34. I want to link to this article where we're talking about physicians who either have or have not begun their career, their finances. And you talk about the idea of retirement planning. I don't even really like that phrase as much as like financial independence and moving towards full financial autonomy. But talk about how does this unfold in the context of somebody who does it right? And what have you seen? So uh, I think with respect to financial literacy, there's still a giant gap in what people understand and what they need to do. Um, so what, what I like to, the way I like to teach is I like to te teach, especially younger attendings and CRNAs, that you need to think about your 30, your, you need to think about your 40-year-old self, your 50-year-old self, and your 60-year-old self. What's current, like, I'll, for example, I'll get a brand new CRNA or a brand new anesthesiologist, and they think everything is shiny. They're like, this is amazing. Anesthesia is amazing. This is so much fun. And I, and I tell them, I'm like, it is a lot of fun, and it's a very rewarding career. But what you feel, <laughs> the way you feel now may change over the course of time. So why don't you approach it the way you would approach medical school or the way you approach residency? When you approach medical school, you know in four years, you're going to be, you, you start at point A and you're going to end up at point B. Same thing with residency. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. You got to approach your career the exact same way. The question is, what, what is the beginning, middle, and end? Traditionally, most people would say the beginning is when you start and the end is when you stop working and you die. Um, and I wrote an article about that because that's what happens to most people. Um, whereas I'm of, the, I'm of the belief system, and I agree with you 100%, if you can seek out financial independence, the earlier you achieve it, and I'm not talking about being super frugal, but the sooner you achieve it, the more options that you'll have. So for example, let's say 10 years down the road, something fundamentally changes in anesthesia um, that I don't like, I could basically make a shift. I could do something else. I can, uh, you know, I can go become a Walmart greeter. It makes no difference. Um, that being said, I also believe that if you're doing that, you have to measure it. And so me personally, what I do, um, I de I've determined what my spending is. I determine how much money I'm going to have to save in order to support that spending. And then I measure how much I'm going to have to put away every single month based upon the growth, how much, what it's going to look like um, in 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And I literally keep track of it every single month. And I have a spreadsheet so that I know if I'm off or I'm off, if I'm off, uh, or if I'm doing better than what I, my projections are, great. But at least I'm measuring it, and it's always at the top of my mind. Hmm. So as far as having a, a physician charting a path to financial independence in the context of like wanting to insulate themselves from all the, uh, the forces of healthcare that may not be working in their best interest, how do you recommend somebody like sit down and start this process? Because you just used some financial terms there that maybe somebody's like, oh my gosh, he's talking about future income and retirement spending and these things, or that's utterly intimidating and maybe speaking Greek. What kind of resources might you recommend? Or how would you break it down for somebody who says, I love the idea of being financially independent, but I don't even know where to begin? Well, first of all, I would have them go to anesthesiasuccess.com. <laughs> and uh, after that, um, you know, so, so I get this question a lot, actually. So I get a lot of brand new CRNAs um, and even, even uh, brand new physician attendings. And their attitude is, well, you know what? 
I have worked so hard. I have scraped so hard to um, make it here. I want to enjoy myself now. I want to. I want to enjoy the 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 the, the um the joy. What is it? What am I trying to say? The the uh, the pleasures of being and attending and making uh, you know multiples of what I'm used to living off of. And I tell them that's fine and good, but only after you <laughs> only after you've saved 20, 30 percent. Um, so far, I've convinced a lot of my friends to stop, not to buy a house. Uh, if you're just starting out, there's absolutely no reason to buy a house. One of my one of my CRNAs was uh, she's single, she lives with her parents, and she was about to buy a house. And I'm like, is it a nice house that you're living in right now with your parents? She says yes. I'm like, why on earth would you move out of that house? Save the money. Um, so again, I don't think that's an extreme point of view. You could still have fun. You could still go on vacations. Um, even Corey Fossa talks about this in your book. My God, if 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 you were used to making seventy thousand dollars a year, and now you're making half a million. Go spend a hundred thousand dollars. Go nuts, uh, but still yeah. save about two hundred. I mean, there's no reason not to save money, you know. Um, and so, obviously, you want to maximize, uh, max out all your IRAs, uh, maximize your four hundred one ks, whatever your 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 job works. It's free money. I personally, I like to do HSAs. Um, so I maximize my HSA. I maximize. Um, what else do I do? I after I have everything maxed out, then I look at me personally. What I did was I looked at my debt. And then I did basically a snowball of my debt. Um, being, being an anesthesiologist or being any physician for that matter, yes, yes, we are burdened with massive student loans. Um, my, my, me, myself, I actually inherited my wife's student loans on top of that. But, you know, you're young. Uh, even if you're not young, if you're diligent, you could snowball it and get and, and eliminate that, date, that debt at the same time, saving for retirement. And then once that debt is paid off, then you could really um, – start accelerating that saving. Yeah, I have a rule, uh, not a rule, but uh, a thing that I like to share as far as how do we celebrate becoming an attending without doing something we're going to regret, regret. And it's so you can spend as much money as you want, as long as you spend it once. And it's not a recurring payment. If yeah. you're celebrating by doing something that re requires a recurring payment, you're probably not doing it right. And you're gonna, you're gonna shackle yourself to your job longer than perhaps you're going to want to be shackled. I totally agree. Um, so, and let's talk just briefly about financial planning, financial advising, because, you know, we just talked about IRAs and HSAs and maxing things out. And this still might be, I mean, anybody listening right now who has a medical degree definitely is smart enough to be able to understand these concepts, but maybe they just don't have the time or inclination. And they're just thinking, I literally want to outsource this the way I outsource somebody cutting my grass. Uh, and I want to partner with somebody that I know I can trust going forward to be able to have these wealth building debt repayment mechanisms uh, happening for me. Uh, how would you, you know, what, what, do you have any advice or thoughts as it relates to that? Um, yeah, actually I do. I, I, I do think it is incumbent upon an intelligent person to become, um, you need to become financially literate. It's absolutely positively necessary. And, and here's why um, it's a value. Money is a value. Now they say the root, the root of all evil is money, but that's not true. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. That's the actual term. So, but money itself is a tool and it's one of, it's probably like my second highest value. And the reason why it's my second highest value is because I have a huge family to support. Not only am I supporting my, my primary family, I'm supporting other, you know, my, uh, my extended family as well. And as I age, I suspect I'm going to be supporting them even further. So for it not to be a value would be reckless on my, in, in my, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that being said, I, I really highly recommend um, that you read a series of books. Now, they're on my website. You can go to the book club and start reading them. But if, if, if you still need help, by, by all means, you know, they, they say that if you want to learn how to swim, you can go read a book about it. You can watch a YouTube video about it. But... If you really want to learn how to swim, you got to jump in the pool or jump in the ocean and then be with a good instructor. I still feel very strongly about that. Yeah. Um, I personally had a very good instructor um, when I first started my financial journey. And uh, I feel my advisor gave me very, very good counsel. I feel like if you don't know anything, you, you actually, you do need an advisor. You need, you need a team of people, uh, including an attorney, including an accountant. You need uh, what I can't remember what Brent called it. Brent from scope of practice. Uh, you need your board of directors, your personal board of directors, and one of them should be a financial advisor. Now, the controversy is, should you have assets under management or should you be playing fat fee, uh, flat fees? Um, that, again, 
that's controversial. Um, yeah, we could do a whole other podcast on it, compensation mechanisms. It, exactly. But clearly, like you, for example, you are trained. This is this is your this this is what you study every single day. You you've been educated about this. So for me to to not take advice from you would be silly, right? It would be unwise. So um, I, I definitely think everybody needs a team to help them with these decisions early on. As you get better, as you you know get more literacy with respect to these different topics, yeah, maybe you can start managing your own portfolio, which is what I do. So me personally, I manage my own portfolio. I'm very comfortable doing that. I've read thousands of pages. Um, I've actually you know um, I've jumped into the into the swimming pool and I've made uh, I've studied it. You know I have spreadsheets about it. I keep very 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 close track of my of of how I'm performing with respect to the S and P 500 index. Um, so my, my job, my goal is not to, to beat it. I just want to keep up with it. Um, and so that's my personal philosophy and it's been serving me very well up until this point. But I personally think if you know absolutely nothing about, um, I'm sorry about that. If you know absolutely nothing about investing, especially with respect to the, the stock market, um, yeah, you definitely need an advisor. And if you want to invest in real estate, then you need another advisor who's an expert in real estate. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm obviously biased in this department, but uh, having a fee-only advisor, meaning somebody who doesn't earn any commissions, who has a transparent fee model, meaning I know exactly how much I'm paying my advisor every month, every quarter, every year. And in exchange for that payment, I'm getting good counsel, I'm getting a financial plan, I'm getting investment management, and I'm getting somebody to both educate and do the work, the actual tasks of financial planning, financial management. That pays for itself in spades nine times out of 10 for physicians. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent, big believer in that, obviously. Well, you know, and, and just like I read the financial news every single day. And unless you're willing to do that, um, there's so much going on. Like regulation changes all the time. Laws change all the time. And so if you're not abreast of that, you absolutely need somebody to help you with that. So I, for that, I 100% totally agree. Yeah. So let's let's pivot back to you know the, the article we we're talking about before. So beginning with the end in mind, talk right. to talk uh, a little bit about uh, some of the people in your life uh, who who you've seen walk down this path one way or the other, either being really well regimented and planning appropriately, or maybe uh, taking the the path that you wouldn't necessarily recommend. And how do those things play out? So the the, the main article I had written um, is I think it was like you remember the name of the article? It is. Why doctors need a retirement plan before starting their practice. Excellent. So in this, the, the premise of this particular article is a story of two physicians, okay? They're both friends. They both went to you know medical school residency together, and then they both ended up starting practice together, and they made this pact. And the pact was, um, if I ever appear or if I ever lack the skill to take care of my patients because I'm like slowing down or... Um, if something happens to me where I'm, I'm no longer capable of knowing when to quit, they, they made a pact with each other to help the other person to quit medicine. And not quit in a bad way, but to say, you know what, maybe it's time you step down. And um, so I, I kind of talk about the whole story and, and how uh, the, 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 the way I found out about the story is I would eat lunch with a, with a peer. And he was a much older peer than me. And he always gave really sage advice. Uh, but one day, uh, you know, I was sitting there with him and he looked a little tired and I said, Hey, uh, when are you going to retire? He said, well, you know, maybe next year. I said, really? I said, well, how old are you now? He's like, well, I'm 73. Uh, I still, you know, I have stuff to do. Uh, you know, I got, I have all these patients to see and I have this procedure to do. And, and he would always make these excuses why he didn't want to retire. Meanwhile, his kids don't ever live in the city. They, they live outside of the city. He has all these grandkids he wants to spend time with. And I said, well, what's your dream? If you could retire today, what would be your dream? He's like, I want to spend time with my grandkids, you know, go to the beach, go sailing with them, et cetera. I said, well, what are you waiting for? He said, you just should do it. He's like, well, maybe next year. I said, okay. So this kept on playing out year after year. And I think actually when it first started, it was around 66. So this played out over four or five years. But finally, one day, you know, uh, I find out that he got really sick. Okay. And once, once I, before, before you realize it, we realized he had some, he had terminal cancer. Okay. Wow. And he didn't, he basically made it six months and I don't want to go into details of the story. I don't want to, you know, 
because you know, I'm sure members of the community staff, uh, my community know who he is. Um, but he basically passed away. And uh, I remember running into his friend and I said, hey, you know, that's really sad what happened to your friend there. He said, yeah, he pushed it a little bit too far. And I said, yeah, sometimes people do that. Well, what about you? I said, you're, 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 you're kind of right there with them. What, what's, what's your plan? He's like, uh, don't, don't worry about me. He tells me, I, I know when, I know when I'm, when I need to quit, I got all kinds of plans. I'm going to go golfing. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go, uh, traveling and I have all these plans and I'm like, okay, great. Well, when are you going to do them? He's like, probably next year. <laughs> yeah. So long Dang story, share it. <laughs> uh, my, my goodness. And, and he said, I'm nothing like him. I said, he's like, I told him not to do it. I told him not to do it. And yet he went and he did it and didn't listen to me. Um, so I did not tell this in the article, but like literally a year later, it's been, I'm sorry, two years later, exact same thing happens to him, hmm. you know, and now he has terminal cancer. He never retired and um, he never lived out the, the dream that he wanted to post retirement. And for me, that to me, it's sad. I, and I think it's a generational thing because I know a lot of gen, gen um, baby boomers who are totally okay with that. They want to work till they die. Um, me personally, I just don't think that was a very good executed plan. Um, whereas like take somebody like Corey Fawcett, the day he turned, I can't remember what it was, 56 or 57. I can't remember. He was done. He told his partners, I'm sorry, this was the plan from since day one in medical school. I started it with the, with the end in mind. And now I'm done. And I have all of these plans that I'd like to execute, but I can't if I continue to practice medicine. So um, me personally, that resonates with me. And so when I mentor or coach somebody, I always basically, I, I try to help them pin down a date. Hmm. And for young people, it's really interesting. They think they're going to go till they're 65. When you start talking to 40-year-olds, they say, oh, I'll go till 50. And then when you start, start talk to 50 year olds, they say, well, I think I'll be done in five years. And so, yeah, you, you know, if you know that number early on, it's an option. You don't have to do it. So let's say you become financially independent at age 50. Great. Now you basically have options. So if you don't like the institution that you're working at because of the insurance, maybe you can go start a concierge practice. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can go start a, you know, anesthesia on the traveling on the road practice. Um, there's a group in Columbus called Smile MD. They basically have a group of anesthesiologists who go from dentist office to dentist office, and they work on a cash basis. They, they, they love their work. So you have unlimited options once you achieve financial independence. Yeah, and I think the key takeaway here uh, is not quit your job as soon as possible, as much as live intentionally figure out what the things are that are really important to you. And if you want to work until you're 70 because it's so enriching for you and you enjoy working with patients and making it different in an intimate way that you can't do in any other way, then great. Do it exactly. and be, be free from the stresses and the strains of being financially encumbered in that context. Uh, and you may find that if you're living intentionally, I want to build X number of hours per week in my schedule with my wife or with my kids or do these other things or take this trip, you may be able to do that and have the, the vocational pursuit that you want if you start today, if you intentionally reflect and, you know, like the, what you said before, like when there needs to be a change, I, I can't remember the gentleman who you said had this paradigm. It's like, something's got to change. It's got to be now and it's got to be me. Um, once you sort of internalize that, uh, it can, it like the whole world opens up to you. And that's one of the things that I love about being a financial planner is sitting down with my clients at times and saying, hey, like, let's draw your dream life right now. What does it look like? And what we often find is we don't need to be 67 with $7 million in the bank in order to live three quarters of that dream life. We can actually get a lot of the way there today by just being a little bit more intentional. You know, and, and a funny thing happened now that I'm part-time, and now that I'm living an intentional life and I, and, um, and I, I feel financially comfortable, I feel like I enjoy medicine again. It's the weirdest thing. Mm. And having said that, I feel like um, since if somebody comes with a new regulation in healthcare, like there's a new EMR update or if there's a new policy that's going to impact my, 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 the way I practice medicine, um, perfect example. I was just told last week I can't use desflurane anymore. Right. Mm, that's right. And, right. And so, um, 
you would be surprised. You, I mean, maybe you're not surprised. Everybody was infuriated. Like, how dare they say I can't use desflurane? You know, and yeah. you know what kind of environment are they talking about? All the authorities are blah blah blah. And so, like, they're they're, they're giving away so much energy, and they're putting out all this negative energy. They're making themselves miserable over something that, you know, is it going to change my practice a little bit? Yeah, kind of a little bit. Is it going to? Is it going to? Is it going to change my opinion of myself? Is it going to change my happiness? Is it going to change the way I practice medicine? Not at all. Yeah. In fact, you know, I, I tell I tell people who say that I'm like, it's not really worth, you know, the the cortisol. It's not worth the stress yeah. to get upset about something like that. Um, and if you want to fight the good fight, by all means, do it. Um, yeah. But don't let it control your life because at the end of the day, what really matters is, you know, you your health, your family. Um, the job is, you know, taking care of your patient matters, but the job itself, eh, it doesn't matter so much, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I think it was maybe episode 13. I interviewed uh, Dr. Timur Ozelsel, who is the head of the uh, the green anesthesia uh, special interest group of ASRA. And he was telling me about desflurane and how I think he said the stat that sticks in my mind is uh, doing a, you know, a day's worth of procedures with desflurane is the equivalent of driving a car from like Cape Town to Oslo, Norway, or so- something like that. It's like a from an environmental impact standpoint. And I know that that's been something that's, uh, I guess, been on the radar in the anesthesia community. So what's, what's fascinating about that though, is if you, if you look, what, what really makes people unhappy is the sense of loss, right? Yeah. If you have loss in your life, if you had something and then it's taken away, that results in unhappiness, right? But if you look at something like desflurane as an example, you, if you never, if you never had it in the first place, there would be no loss. But the fact that somebody gave it to you and then they took it away, you feel a sense of loss. But the reality is, there are plenty of good alternatives. So it would be different if if somebody said, "Hey, you can't do uh, practice anesthesia with volatile anesthetics anymore." That would be okay, fine. I mean, I'm have to do Tiva every day. Oh my god, I, that I get. Uh, but even then, it still fundamentally would not impact me. It's not going to emotionally have anything to do with my life. And I, I feel like a lot of anesthesiologists, basically they, they live for finding the next thing that the hospital is going to take away from them so they can just kind of complain to the world about it. And I, that's just no way to live a life, if, in my humble opinion. Sure. And I think that's human nature. And it's not, it's not unique to the specialty by any stretch. Exactly. Um, awesome. Well, I want to wrap it up here. Uh, Jesse, I really thank you for your time today. In closing, you know, are there any other like either words of wisdom or resources to which you would want to point us or, you know, key considerations that you want to leave us with as far as developing a life of, you know, contentment today so that we're insulated from some of the challenging environmental factors in the practice of medicine? Absolutely. Um, so for me, my, my website is all about kind of uh, finding my way. And in that process, I hope other people will find their way as well. So the, the best quote I can give for you is work on yourself more than you work on your job. Okay. So if you can be a better version of yourself than you were yesterday and, and you have growth every day, that is the key to happiness. If you feel like you're receding, okay, and if you feel like the world's uh, impacting you, if you feel like everything that, that that determines your happiness is from without, then you're not going to be very happy. Whereas if you realize that all your happiness is right within you, you're going to be a very, very happy person. Um, that's, that's, that's about it. So me personally, I feel transformed. Uh, I used to be, I used to have tremendous burnout. I don't have burnout anymore. Um, I feel like even the loss of my medical directorship, that was loss. Okay. I was paid to be the medical director. I had a title. I felt like I had prestige. I was in charge. All of that was taken away. And I'm telling you right now, for me, that was a blessing. It was the biggest blessing in disguise because now I can focus on things that really matter to me. Um, And so I don't see it as loss anymore. I see it as a gift. And so one more thing, if you're going to blame somebody for how bad your life is, make sure you blame them for how good your life is as well. Hmm. Wise words. Dr. Jesse Lopez, thank you very much for joining us today on the Anesthesia Success Podcast. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to anesthesiasuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesiology and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I would also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on the Anesthesia Success Podcast.